So we begin these Wednesday nights together with some sitting practice. So you can find yourself into a, a position that will be comfortable enough for your body for the next half hour or so. Let me just do a little quick check. Is the sound okay? Great. Okay. All right, so just finding a good position for the body. And once you're there with the posture, just accepting the position you've chosen for the body. Just allowing, inviting all the energies to settle. This might feel like a radical thing to do, but really we can just have this one intention for practice, and that is we're just trying to find some rest. Resting the body, resting the heart mind. We're not demanding calm or demanding ease even. We're not demanding peace. We're just reminding ourselves that our job is just to rest. We don't have to fight. We don't even have to try hard. We don't have to avoid. We don't have to get away. And with this invitation to be at rest, we can just watch what's happening. How does it feel? How do you know? How do you know it feels like this?
And the habit energy from the previous moment, whatever we were doing before we decided to get still, will follow us into this moment. So we might be feeling the momentum of doing or distraction. And that's really okay. We're just in touch with nature. Like oh, life has a force. And that can be felt internally. Both with the body and the heart. Even if it feels slightly unpleasant, we're actually learning that we don't have to run. We can just be here with the same simple intention to rest with anything. To rest with even this We're actually coming into alignment with the truth of how things are, with the force of nature, the force of habit. And when we can feel that, it's actually good news. God, look at this in alignment with the way things are. So we're actually receiving life as it reveals itself to us, the flow of life, the thoughts, the emotions, the body sensations, the sounds, the images, all the various ways of relating Pleasant experience, unpleasant experience. And 
We're learning how to rest with the flow. Not resisting life at all. And if the flow of life becomes unbearable somehow, overwhelming, we have tools. We can begin first by just remembering that we don't have to do anything. We don't have to perform. We don't have to get anywhere. We don't have to be a good meditator. Our job is just to rest and see if that's supportive. Just that reminder that, sweetie, all I have to do is rest. Nothing more. And if that doesn't do the trick, it's okay. We have other tools. We can open our eyes and let in a little light as an experiment. Is it possible to rest now? Or maybe we try something else like opening to the pleasant. With the same question, is it possible to rest now? So we're playing, we're experimenting. And we're learning what's supportive, what helps this heart rest. And in that restful place, it becomes easier and easier to be in the flow the flow of life. And we'll continue in silence now.
And you can open your eyes whenever you're ready. Thank you for your practice. Feel free to move the body, you can stand or stretch, whatever your body's asking for. Before we get down to business, let's just check in on each other. Perhaps look around, say hello. Some of you might want to say hello in the chat. Just peruse the faces and the smiles, the names. Send a little metta all around to the sides. And maybe five or seven people want to just name what you're coming to the program with, maybe in one or three or four words, just a few words, like, how are you doing right now? It can be really validating, affirming to See or read the range of human experience that's in the room right now. I feel fragile. Mm. Thanks, Jennifer. Tired, a bit wrung out, calm. Yeah. Energy, great. Grateful, thanks Rob. So maybe we can just establish a collective intention to just allow our systems to be how they are, right? To not have to work very hard, to not feel like our um, job is to push. And just come with an intention to rest and be and allow, you know, or using whatever word or image makes sense for you, just to have that reminder. So welcome. We'll continue tonight an exploration of uh, chapter three in Listening to the Heart, this wonderful book. A Contemplative Journey to Engaged Buddhism, written by Tanisra and Kitasaro. And if you don't have to, you don't um, have to have read it. Uh, but if you're interested in following along, we're taking a slow, meandering journey through the book using the chapters and the teachings from Tanisra and Kitasaro as a jumping off place for our reflections here together. So if you want to read it, um, you, we posted 
the chapters, chapters one, two, and three, I believe, are posted on, on the website, on the calendar. So you can go there and check those out. But again, um, you don't have to, and uh, you don't actually have to be, you, you won't need to be here tonight in order to understand or uh, follow along on what I talk about next week. So every every talk will stand alone. That's the intent. And so chapter three is written by Kitty Saro and it's called A Steady Mind. And so we'll, we're taking a few weeks to explore what it means to have a steady mind and in particular, this teaching on samadhi and what that means in particular um, as we live, live full and rich lives and at a time of um, racial injustice, unrest, and global pandemic. Oof, just saying that. No wonder why we feel tired and a bit lazy or challenged in moments. I certainly feel challenged in moments. So I'm really curious about, you know, this, these teachings that point us to cultivation of heart and mind that can be available in, in wholesome ways to meet us where we are in our lives, both um, in times of uh, when our lives are simple and in times when our lives are really complicated. So I felt enlivened by the reflection over the past few weeks as I prepared for teaching. And I, I hope you have found ways to be enlivened by your practice as you explore the teachings too, in whatever ways you are. So in some ways, as we are, you know, understanding the context that we're living in. We're also learning how to receive the essence of the teachings and apply the teachings to our, our lives. So we're broadening, some, somewhat broadening, broadening how we might relate to the teachings, broadening it from a limited viewpoint to a, a more inclusive understanding. And I say this because, like I've said before, um, sometimes samadhi can be translated as concentration. It's quite often translated that way. But there are many ways to understand what the Buddha meant in his teachings on samadhi or a steady mind. And so we want to see how close we can get to the essence and also really ask that our practice be relevant, right? So that we don't have to feel like we have to wait for the mind to get really still or to have the time for a retreat or until we're wise enough to understand what, what it's like to be in jhana or anything like this, right? So we wanna understand like, oh, what is it like right now? in the beginning, in the middle, in the end, wherever we are on the path. So I just used a word called I said jhana, and jhana is one of the, in one of the, in, in the teachings is, we can talk about jhana as like deeper and deeper states of continuity or concentration or unification of the energies of heart, mind, and body. And so it feels useful to reflect on the words of the Buddha from the beginning. So jhana, this is from the Buddha. Jhana is called the pleasure of renunciation, the pleasure of seclusion, the pleasure of peace, the pleasure of enlightenment. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should be pursued, that it should be developed, 
that it should be cultivated, that it should not be feared. And such a lovely description of what this, what this work is for us as we cultivate a steady mind. And the pointing to the pleasure of letting go, the pleasure of seclusion, the pleasure of peace, the pleasure of enlightenment, the pleasure of renunciation, renunciation, that, that uh, value of letting go, the value of simplicity. On the eve of the Buddha's awakening, as the story goes, he sat under a tree and had a memory, a childhood memory, actually, of sitting under um, a rose apple tree, I believe. And just that nice, pleasant feeling of simplicity. And the memory of that moment was actually beneficial then and changed the Buddha's relationship to life. So learning that pleasant, that it can be pleasant to both practice and do this work of practice, do this work of meditation of mindful engagement in our lives, that there can be a pleasant feeling there. And we can actually turn towards the pleasant when we need to find some way to rest into the present moment. So pleasant experience has a real important place in our practice. And I don't know about you, but I need to rem remind myself of that these days. I have a serious commitment of turning towards, of understanding uh, dukkha and of not being afraid to be uncomfortable. And so sometimes with this mind, it can forget that pleasant experience is available right here too and important for balance and to be able to rest in and feel deeply into the truth of the present moment. And perhaps in this time of pandemic when we are uh, not being as, as physically close to each other as we would like, we're not getting as much touch as we would like, it can be, for me, sometimes I find myself just trying to get by. And then in moments, realizing, oh, right, there was something missing, something that could have, that is, could you, that could be useful, beneficial for the settling, for the steadying of awareness. Last weekend, I had a social, social visit, you know, distance, physical distancing visit with some friends. And it was light and playful and really, really um, nourishing to the nervous system. Sitting in someone's backyard, nothing to do, nowhere to go. Just enjoying laughter and company and playful banter. Just really appreciating, you know, the personalities in the room. Like, oh, we're such interesting, weird creatures here. And that feeling of, you know, that satisfying feeling of just being able to accept what it's like to be in relationship was carried me for, you know, a good day. I remembered that. I remembered that, that good feeling, that pleasant feeling. The mind was awake enough in the moment of being there with friends to appreciate the kind of simplicity of just being there and then later in the evening remembering like oh how sweet that was oh sweetie don't forget this that it's nice to be in physical proximity to people you care about and then the next day remembering like oh wasn't that nice how that carried forward right how that lasted through the evening with just the memory oh don't forget that that even the memory is important So remembering that, remembering to appreciate and be willing to look for pleasant experience.
<clears throat> In the beginning of chapter three, um, Kitty Saro recounts a, uh, a teaching from a, uh, one of his teachers, perhaps, or somebody that he knew. Uh, the Thai forest master, Ajahn Tate, described the essential purpose of meditation as discerning the difference between mind and activity of mind. In order to see the difference, there needs to be steadiness of attention. So the steadiness of attention that allows us to see the activity of mind. Without this steadiness, we just become caught up in the activity of mind. And the only way to make sense of that is to construct a sense of self, right? Because there's no, there's not enough, there's not enough steadiness, there's not enough concentration or continuity or gathered attention to actually see more deeply than that. So we, we want to be able to cultivate the steadiness of mind so that we can know the difference between the mind that's caught up in doubt, the mind that's caught up in fear, the mind that's flooded with delusion, confusion. We want to be able to see these mind states that come and go, apathy, anger. We want to be able to feel the pleasantness of joy and gratitude and know that all of it is just a flow, right? It's not actually who I am. And when we can see into this distinction between mind and activity of mind, or awareness of activity of mind, it's actually freeing. There's actually more energy that's revealed to be present, to give fully, to engage, to feel into our resiliency. It's like the mind really learns something or we really learn something by watching. We learn, ah, oh, look at this. You know, this thought, this thought, I actually can notice a thought. I can notice when a thought ar arises or passes away. I can notice when there was a thought that I was really indulging that's no longer there, a fantasy in the mind that's somehow vanished. Oh, we can see like that was just an activity, an activity of the mind, right? It is such a liberating experience to feel things come and go. It can feel scary, but it's actually deeper than fear. It's actually quite liberating to be able to rest in the flow of life. This is more from Kitty Saro. The Buddha likened the mind, uh, sorry, that's not what I wanted to read. This is what I wanted to read. <laughs> we are so easily swept away and flooded by our thoughts and feelings. We become intoxicated when we feel inspired and devastated when we feel hopeless. Sometimes to the extent that we think we'll solve the problem by taking our own life, this is killing the wrong thing. If we are going to kill something, it should be our delusions. With presence of mind, we begin to see these delusions. If we float along a river dozing away, we won't necessarily notice where the currents are taking us. However, if we try to stop and stay still, making contact with the ground, we'll clearly discern the powerful pull of the stream. In the same way, when we're swept along by the moods of the mind, we don't tend to see them. When we are still in meditation, the activity of mind becomes clear. When we are still in meditation, the activity of mind becomes clear. So with increasingly settled energy, we begin to see the activities of mind, thoughts, feelings, images, emotions, 
with more and more clarity. And it's actually this, this steady energy that allows the seeing. Without steadiness, the mind makes mistakes and misperceives. The only conclusion, right, when we don't see thoughts coming and go, is to believe that this is me, this is mine, this is who I am. But with steady energy of mind, of heart and mind, we begin to see the, what I call, I'm calling the flow. We actually begin to see nature. It becomes easier to see that, oh, wow, this is seemingly, you know, that this doesn't actually feel so personal. Where did that thought come from? Nod your head if you've ever been sitting in meditation and a thought just from third grade or something like far off just popped in your mind. Nod your head if you're with me. Yeah. <laughs> it feels so weird, doesn't it? And it, you're like, wow, that was, that was in there somewhere. Okay. So we're actually getting a glimpse of, of nature. Yeah. So our, each moment that we live has a profound impact on our whole system. Even moments that are, we feel like we, you know, didn't really cause a big problem for us. No significant trauma, just a regular ordinary moment can be there and be, and, and come to the surface in a moment when we don't expect it. And then there are the moments that are really profound and very intimate and sometimes challenging and sometimes really beautiful. And those stay with us too. So it makes sense that because of the impact, right, the felt impact on this heart body in moments that the system would somehow uh, try to retain some of its energy. Okay, so with steadiness, we begin to see this flow and it doesn't feel as personal, like, oh yeah, impact, conditioning, nature, this is what it's like right now. This is what it's like to have a heart and a body that is connected and cares and is impacted both internally and externally by my life, by others, by the world. And there's a, a memory, a system of remembering so that we can somehow be protected. And when we start to see this, it's really, it can be really uh, relieving, like, oh, We're not doing anything wrong. We're actually waking up to the truth of mental formations and body sensations and this whole interconnected life that we're living. So this energy of samadhi, this practice, the effort that it takes to practice, and it takes some effort, right, to train this heart, mind, to be steady. And it's with this energy of samadhi, this steadying energy, that we develop by applying some effort moment to moment to moment in our lives, especially in simple moments. This is where the training happens. We develop some continuity, some habit energy, that carries forward to the next moment, it makes it a little easier. It's without that steadying energy, we're really limited in our capacity as citizens too. There are many moments for all of us where we, are, where we don't know that we're not aware, right? We're just living, living our lives, we're swept away by thought, and we don't know that we're doing that until we start practicing and we start to see the flurry of thoughts that are there. For example, I remember being on retreat and this stayed with me for many years, waking up to how, how many thoughts flow through my mind. I didn't, I didn't actually know that until the mind started, the energy started settling, steadying, and it became more and more clear that the mind that often what I'm doing, what I'm acting out, my body activities are in relationship to a thought that flew through the mind. And that emotional experience is body, body sensations, 
in relationship to thoughts. And that often propels me forward too, to do this or do that. So noticing like I was startled, like, wow, planning and evaluating and rehearsing kind of this incessant stream of I am the center of the universe. And that is, that is what happens when the mind, when our minds become more steady and more used to the habit of connecting and sustaining in our lives. And so without that, you can, we know, actually, we don't even have to imagine, we know what happens when we are responding in our lives and in the world without any steadiness of mind. We're actually just acting out all of the unskillful habits that have been there. Sometimes some skillful, but generally using distraction as our guide, avoidance as our guide, denial as our guide. And so the habits of greed and aversion and confusion and delusion, not seeing clearly, just get established. And we don't know, we don't know often that we're planting seeds that are harmful both to us and to each other. So this value of studying the mind, being able to watch, being able to track what's happening with our bodies and our hearts, helps us be more skillful in relationship with each other, helps us know what we're setting in motion. So sometimes you, uh, I've heard comments that, you know, I don't know how the Dharma is related to social justice work or the Dharma and social justice work should be two different things. And it, in this way, with this kind of deeper understanding, then that doesn't make that much sense, right? Because it doesn't make sense to say that anything actually is unrelated to dharma. Because the, our capacity of our minds, the health of our hearts and minds, are directly related to all that, all that our bodies do. All the work that we do, the physical work, the connecting work, our jobs, our engagement as... Um, socially engaged citizens in whatever ways that we are. And it's hard to actually, it's hard to talk about this without naming, you know, my experience as a white bodied person and learning to wake up to all of the ways that um, whiteness, domination, all of the ways that I have learned, this body, this heart, have learned to perpetuate harm and how as a organism, you know, white bodied people have perpetuate harm in creation of systems of domination. And as Resma Menikim would say, also uh, uh, a philosophy that we take with us into the world that we're living in. So for me, I really care about that. Just like I care about not causing harm right here in my house, I care about not causing harm in the world. And so in order to wake up to the ways that we some, some, uh, habitually and often without knowing cause harm in the world, we need to learn how to cultivate a steady heart and mind so that we can notice the components, right? that we can notice the components, the feelings, the body sensations, the thoughts that perpetuate, that move forward in the creation of philosophies and systems. So without samadhi, we're limited in our capacity as citizens too. And this requires a nuanced understanding from us, our limitations, you know, to understand both the possibilities and our limitations requires a nuanced understanding. So 
as we cultivate steadiness, we're actually cultivating an attitude of non-resistance to life, non-resistance to what's right in front of us. Right? We're not actually, we're learning how to be vulnerable and to live into our vulnerability. And it's in that relaxation that the heart becomes vulnerable and that we begin to see and know more deeply. And in this, in this uh, practice, this non-resistant attitude, non-resistance to life, we can actually develop a deeper and stronger resiliency to deal with life or to do what's being asked of us. Because we are learning how to not be afraid. As we're cultivating non-resistance, right, we're cultivating letting go of bad habits, letting go of clinging to our habits of delusion and denial and on and on. We're learning how to shed that. And in that shedding, there's like a sense of like, oh, well, I'm in the flow now. I'm actually seeing life. I'm feeling things come and go. I'm actually seeing the force of habit that's moving through our culture. I'm actually seeing the force of racism and all the ways that racist structures and norms have been established from the inception of this country. I'm actually seeing that more clearly and it's really hard to take in. So this vulnerability, the sensitivity that's established as the, as the mind gets more and more steady, more and more capable of seeing clearly, actually, you know, we develop this resiliency like that resistance to taking in discomfort becomes lessened. I was speaking with a, another friend the other day and she was talking to me about like a, a very, you know, a, a slight health issue that she's having. And I asked if she was in pain and she's done a lot of really long retreats. And her response was, uh, after doing a lot of re long retreat, my relationship to pain is so much different. I would call it, she said she would call it slight discomfort. And so this is the value of cultivating steadiness of mind. We become more and more resilient, more and more capable of breathing in, feeling our own vulnerability, the vulnerability of the world, our communities, internal, external forces, relationships, all of that. And we become stronger with a lot more capacity And as, you know, we came to this program, we, we, some of us were named feeling a little worn out. And that makes a lot of sense because a lot is moving for us right now. A lot is moving in our hearts every day. A lot is moving in the news and the world and our communities and our relationships. We're dealing with um, complications. And so tapping into finding a way to cultivate our resili resiliency is really important. The pandemic is not going away. Racism in all its forms aren't going away. So what do we have that will strengthen resiliency? Samadhi is the ability to gather the attention and learn in very simple moments not to resist life. This is the essence. This practice of connecting is resourcing. I've been practicing a more radical kind of self care these days. And I've been more committed to watching the system throughout the day and more willing to do something to support its resiliency. 
So for example, I've taken a couple of naps when I've been tired. Naps can be useful. <laughs> and I've been practicing admitting when I don't feel okay. I don't feel great emotionally or physically. I've been taking walks. I take a walk every day, I walk my dog. And I've been more intentional when walking to not push to get rigorous exercise or to tick off a task off my list, but just to be there and find some pleasure in the movement and the enjoyment, the enjoyment of actually doing the work of taking care of my body, of taking care of my dog. And what's interesting is that I've been noticing an increased energy to be present, an increased energy um, that feels less resistant to life. Right? I, I don't actually have to push anything away. There's a harmony and more of a harmony or an alignment that has been sweet. Like this willingness to take care, this willingness to land, like, oh, tune in. Oh, the system is tired. I'm wondering what's needed. Well, let me just close my eyes for two or three minutes and see if that's supportive. Oh, look at that. It is supportive. Or let me just stop what I'm doing and have a drink of water. Or let me see if in the midst of these, active, these uh, chores that I need to get done in the next half an hour, if I can actually just be here with it. If you've ever had an exercise routine, you might see this, that in the beginning, you know, like I've been a runner off and on throughout my life. And in the beginning, or I see this even when I go out for a walk, as you get started, it's a little bit hard. It takes some effort, it takes some motivation. You have, we have to get ourselves out the door, we have to get ourselves dressed. You know, the first few minutes are a little bit challenged, the body doesn't, hasn't settled into a comfortable breathing yet, or, you know, the muscles need to get limbered up, the joints need to get limbered up and all of that. But after a few minutes, then it's like the body is the heart, the mind, everything is accepting of the activity. It becomes easier and easier. And this is like the flow of samadhi. This is how the mind becomes steady. It takes a little bit of effort to get going. And then with that, with that intention to be present, to be in our lives, to be with our activities, the mind, this heart, this constitution learns that habit. Ah, oh, and it becomes easy. And then there's actually a bit of a pleasant feeling that can be felt. And actually that pleasant feeling, like, okay, it's like a pleasant feeling of appreciating the activity, the effort, the engagement. It actually feels good to take care of myself. It actually feels good to be doing this. It actually feels good to be committing to practice. It actually feels good to be participating. Even if we don't know, we, have, we don't have perfect clarity about what we're doing. It feels good to be at 38th in Chicago. It feels good to be reading some difficult texts, to be feeling into the discomfort of racism, of whiteness. The effort of engaging and accepting activities actually feels good. One more story, and then um, I'd love to hear from you. Many years ago now, I uh, was working at a school, and the school closed mid-year very abruptly. Um, we got little notice. The community got little notice. 
And I had taken some time off to be on retreat and just come back. And it was shocking the reality of the situation that was unfolding really quickly. And I remember walking up to the second floor and kind of looking out over the neighborhood and feeling into the pain of the moment that parents and children, the confused kids didn't understand what was happening and parents were really frustrated, angry, hopeless. And then all of the teachers that were losing their jobs and the principal that felt defeated and it was such a painful experience. I remember walking up there and just like taking a moment because I could just tell that the heart wasn't really metabolizing all that was happening and just pausing there and feeling a lot of heartbreak. And it was in that heartbreak that the, that there was this, there was a, it was a very unusual experience because on the other side of the heartbreak, there was a feeling of gratitude. Gratitude that the heart had cultivated the habit of feeling. And that afforded the capacity to care and move with that caring energy. So this is the value of samadhi. This is the value of a steady mind. We don't have to be afraid of vulnerability or intimacy. We can actually practice cultivating this strength, this resiliency that allows us to just be stay in the game. Even if we don't know what we're doing all the time, even if it feels unpleasant or uncomfortable. Or a couple of um, resources that I'll post in the chat in a bit, but that I've been, uh, you know, I've mentioned that and many of you I know do too, have a serious commitment to understanding uh, racial injustice, living in the midst of racial injustice, taking care of ourselves and each other in the midst of racial injustice, being awake to all of the conditions that influence where we are right now. And so as a white bodied person, one of the practices is learning how, learning, seeing how uh, much the system really wants to rest in comfort instead of be uncomfortable. And so as a practice, really valuing discomfort. And so understand this discernment, right, that it's very, it's a nuanced discernment of knowing, and this can be true for all of us, no matter what your racial background is, no matter what your cult cultural conditioning is, Right? We have to like fine tune this discernment so that we know when it's time to take care of ourselves, to stop and pause and to take a nap or to close our eyes or to do something that will refresh our capacity and when to be in the discomfort because the discomfort itself, when we're able to be with it with some steadiness, affords us the resiliency that we need. So this is an important place for us to play. And so a couple of, Patrice actually sent me a, a couple of resources and um, I'll post a couple of them in, in the chat. I thought were really powerful um, ways of practicing this discernment. So both connecting with the discomfort and um, yeah, watching watching our systems and our capacity to be, be with it all. Okay. Thanks for your attention. Let's just take a deep breath together, can we? Let go of the words. And we have 10 more minutes, so time to hear from each other.
I'd love to hear anything that you have to say about a steady mind, any of your reflections or that you've had previously, or maybe what the talk has inspired for you. Questions are welcome too, but you don't have to have a question. You can just share your practice. And it's okay to just unmute yourself and start talking. If you start talking at the same time as someone else, you'll know what to do. Nobody has a steady mind. <laughs> I know what that's like. I mean, it's such a good reminder that sometimes we want to be equanimous. We want compassion. Yeah, those are... Um, beautiful mind states and we feel good about that and sometimes what most of the time what's being asked of us is not you know is to rest in something to find that way to rest with fear or discomfort or yeah but it can be really beautiful to notice the mind that doesn't want it you know like oh i don't want this i want something else i want this life to be different i want this mind to be different i want to relate different and sometimes that just acknowledging that can really break the heart open i know this fear is hard i don't want this it's hard to be a being that doesn't know what's here <laughs> and we just care about that Sometimes the heart naturally knows what to do in some of these moments. Thank you. Yeah. Waking up is not easy. It can feel like sometimes we've lost something. You know, like I don't have that delusion anymore. I'm not relying on this fantasy anymore because I've seen it and I know it doesn't deliver the goods. So I'm cultivating this new fragile habit of mindful presence. And it's weak, and it's sometimes um, scary, yeah. But it's also more reliable. And so even though it feel, might feel like um, it would just be so much easier to eat a whole cake, <laughs> <laughs> we already know because we've tried that and we know it doesn't work <laughs> so it'd be better just to enjoy the pleasantness of a bite or two or piece of cake right and appreciate that you know we can even appreciate when the mind has a memory or a fantasy that leaves a residue so we don't have to we don't have to demonize that part of us either like sometimes the mind will flip through a fantasy and it will leave a kind of a pleasant or humorous or you know like feeling behind 
And so we can go, oh yeah, look at that. Looking for happy. It doesn't, it's not going to be, you know, we don't want to just try to fantasize our way through life because we know that that doesn't work and we actually want to be present. But we actually can appreciate the mind that wants to take care of ourselves like that too, right? Like there is, we can turn to pleasant experience when we need to feel resourced. Like we can, why not enjoy the food that we have? We don't have to be sort of nihilistic about things or afraid to appreciate the pleasant experiences that we have, the resources that we can feel really grateful for having a roof over our heads, food to eat, water to drink. We can drink tap water, you know. We have these really creative minds that do weird things and sometimes they're funny and silly and fantastical. Oh, look at that. It's 9 -0. It's 9.02. Oh my gosh. I'll give you back your two minutes next week. So let's just get still for a, another few seconds. Oh, thank you for being here. Just breathing in the good learning that we've had together. And on the exhale, just offering that out to the world. Thanks everybody. I'll hopefully see many of you soon.